I think we will get started. Uh, it's about 10 after the hour, and I'm Carlin Center. I'm the director of our primary care sports medicine program here at UCSF, and really happy to welcome everyone here, both in the room and virtually. Uh, continue the questions coming as we go this morning. We're keeping an eye on those uh, virtually as well as in the room. And we, uh, for those of you uh, watching virtually, we think that the mic is going to work this time. So Lauren, I think, teed that up again. And so I think, I think that'll be better this round. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nick Hadamia. Dr. Hadamia is an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. He is a primary care sports medicine physician. He did his uh, medical degree at Western University, his residency in family medicine at Stanford, and his primary care sports medicine fellowship at UCLA. Dr. Hadamia, uh, his focus is to care for patients of all ages. His, um, he's very interested in preventative medicine, uh, diagnostic ultrasound, interventional ultrasound, and exercises medicine. He is team doctor for the Academy of Art University as well as the Oakland Roots. And as such, he has a ton of experience with concussion care, both in the clinic as well as on the sideline. And so he's a great person to give us a talk on sports concussion in youth, keys for primary care. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hadamia. Thanks, Dr. Center, and good morning again to everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you all about sports concussion in youth and kind of talk about some keys for primary care. As Dr. Center mentioned, uh, I also have some training in primary care. I'm family medicine trained. I have no relevant disclosures. So for today, by the end of this talk, what I hope that you'll come away with is how to define what a concussion is, understand the pathophysiology and epidemiology of a concussion, be able to explain how to do a sideline evaluation. So for those of you who are on the sidelines, being able to do that or feel comfortable doing that or explain to someone how they would go about doing that. Be familiar with the different tools that are available to evaluate a concussion because there's a ton out there if you Google it or look on PubMed or up to date. Be familiar with the typical timeline for recovery for a concussion, both for kids and adults. And then finally, understand how to prescribe a return to play product program as well as a return to learn program. So those are our objectives for today. So let's start with defining what a concussion is. So the broad definition of a concussion, a sports related concussion, is that it's a traumatic brain injury induced by biomechanical forces. Now this is the definition that was released from the most recent um, conference. Let me pull up my little laser pointer here because I like to point throughout my talks. Um, so this is the definition that was uh, published by our uh, experts who convened in Berlin back in 2016, but we'll get an updated definition because this group actually just recently met in October in Amsterdam to kind of talk about concussions again, so more to come. But that's the broad definition. Now if we dive a little deeper, the more comprehensive definition of a concussion is that a sports-related concussion may be caused by either a direct blow to the head, face, neck, or elsewhere on the body, and it causes an impulsive force that's transmitted to the head. This force typically results in rapid onset of short-lived impairment, and this can be mainly of neurologic function that resolves spontaneously. In some cases, though, these symptoms may evolve over a number of minutes to hours, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We know that the blow to the head can result in neuropathologic changes, but the acute clinical signs and symptoms largely reflect a functional disturbance rather than a structural injury. And as such, no abnormality is typically seen on our standard neuroimaging studies. And as you may know, uh, this results in a wide range of clinical signs and symptoms that may or may not involve loss of consciousness. So previously, or you know, it's kind of a misnomer, a lot of patients say, well, I never got a concussion because I never passed out, right? And we know that that's not necessarily true. Um, but these symptoms typically resolve over a very sequential course, but in some cases it may be prolonged, and we'll touch about those prolonged cases towards the end of the talk. And one really important thing is that the clinical signs and symptoms of a concussion can't be otherwise explained by other things such as medications, drugs, alcohol, or other injuries or comorbidities. So now that we know what the definition of a concussion is, let's talk about some of the pathophysiology and epidemiology. 
So how does a concussion happen, right? This is gonna be a, it's a complicated co topic, and so this is, I'm not doing it justice, so this is gonna be a, just a broad overview of uh, the pathophysiology of a concussion, but it really isn't completely understood, and most of our knowledge actually comes from animal models. But we know that there's some sort of force that happens to the brain, and during this time, there's axonal shearing. And what this causes is an indiscriminate release of neurotransmitters at those axons. That indiscriminate release of neurotransmitters leads to this complex neurometabolic cascade. And this leads to mitochondrial dysfunction, the release of reactive oxygen species, and you get unchecked ion influxes. So this is a graph that looks at ion release over minutes, hours, and days. And you can see that all of these different ions here, so glutamate, calcium, glucose, and potassium, shoots up, maybe not so much the glucose, but those other ions really, really fire, fire up, right, as, as we go through that. And this leads to us having a very vulnerable window. So they call this the period of vulnerability, right? So those unchecked ion influxes occur, and what our body wants to always do is maintain homeostasis, right? And so homeostasis requires energy to maintain that, and we use glucose to get energy. So there's a high demand for glucose in that acute concussed phase, but we also know that you have decreased cerebral blood flow during that time, right? And this causes a mismatch, and that mismatch leads to an energy crisis, and that energy crisis is what we believe precipitates those symptoms that we experience when we have a concussion. So again, this is just a very broad overview, not doing the topic justice, but in a sense, that's what we feel happens when you get a concussion. Now let's talk about some of the epidemiology. So it's estimated that around 1.1 to 1.9 million sports-related concussions occur annually in children who are 18 years or younger. And this data is using emergency room data and some of the data from our larger surveillance systems that we have. And as a result, it's likely an underestimation, right? Because some of these systems don't capture all the concussions because they may be underreported. This is some older data, but we do know that there's been an increase in reported concussions from 2001 to 2009 in patients who are younger than 19 years old. And this is probably just due to increased awareness by both athletes and physicians and other healthcare individuals being able to recognize what a concussion is. For some more recent data here in the United States, this is from the CDC in 2020. When we break it down, so we see that on average there's around 7% of um, children who are zero to 17 years of age uh, who are, ever had symptoms of a sports-related concussion. And if we break it down by age group, it kind of makes sense, right? The more active, older individuals tend to have higher incidence of concussion. So the 12 to 17-year-old group tended to have the highest reported concussions followed by the six to 11-year-old group, and then less so in the zero to five age group. What's interesting is if we break this down by gender, so looking at those exact uh, percentages just based off different demographic data, we see that boys tended to have a higher incidence compared to girls. And then gender, or sorry, um, by race, I thought this was interesting as well. So we see that Hispanic white, non-Hispanic whites had the highest reported incidence of concussions, um, and then lo less, less so in the non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic Asian, and Hispanic populations. And you know, this really got me thinking, like this data is really interesting, but why is there discrepancy in, in you know, this, this race, right? And we, and we know that there's some health disparities and we know that this exists in healthcare, not just in sports medicine, but this is an area that we're starting to look at more in sports medicine and I think more research needs to be done in this area. Um, and there's been some really great studies. So this was one published in 2017 that showed that schools who had athletic trainers, just by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with what an athletic trainer is? Yeah, oh, a good amount of you, great. Um, there's a ton of athletic trainers here. They're really excellent, um, and so big plug for them. And I think some of these studies show the importance of having athletic trainers. So schools that had an athletic trainer tended to have a greater number of athletes diagnosed with a concussions compared to schools without one. That kind of makes sense, right? Because if you have a healthcare professional in the school who's familiar with concussions. Uh, white athletes had more knowledge of a concussion and symptoms compared to African Americans, except those who had access to an athletic trainer. So again, another big plug for the athletic trainers in terms of educating our athletes about what a concussion is. Uh, African American children are less likely than non-Hispanic white children to present to the emergency room for a concussion, and they're also less likely to be diagnosed, which is interesting. And then this study published in 2019 showed that uh, concussed children were more likely to receive academic support if they had commercial insurance or parents whose primary language was English. So again, you know, I, we, we talk about that previous slide looking at the breakdown of the incidence of reported concussions and saw it was the highest in non-Hispanic um, white individuals, but I wonder if there's a big component of health disparity playing into that. So uh, definitely a big area of research that we're looking into.
now that we've talked about some of the pathophysiology and the epidemiology, and you are all experts in that, let's talk about the sideline evaluation. I'd like to start with a case. So we have a high school football athlete. We're actually the team physician covering the game. It's near the end of the second quarter. He's our 16-year-old star running back, and he gets tackled. He's slow to get up. The athletic trainer runs onto the field to evaluate the athlete and you know, clears his cervical spine, and he's able to walk off the field. But he has a headache, and he's really sensitive to light and sound. The coach yells at him and says, shake it off. We need you. And then he looks at you and says, is he good to go in? What are your next steps? What are you going to do in this situation? So this is how I approach my sideline management and evaluations of concussions. So if I'm on the field and the athlete's there, the first thing I want to do is, one, make sure the environment's safe, right? So is it safe to go onto the field? That's the first thing. Uh, also, you want to do your ABCs, or I guess they call it the CABs now, right? So circulation, airway, breathing. Do a secondary assessment to make sure that there's no other injured body parts that you're going to miss. And then really just evaluate the cervical spine and then look for any signs or symptoms of a head bleed. And if you're worried about any of those, then I like to activate the emergency action plan. And if those are all fine, then you can proceed to move the athlete to the sidelines to do a more thorough evaluation. And when we're on the sidelines, you may have seen on TV, uh, the colleges and NFLs have these little tents that you can go into. Admittedly, a lot of the athletes just use it to use it as a restroom, which is kind of gross, but that's also what they use it for. Um, but what I like to do is I like to make sure I hold the athlete's helmet because that's really important. And the reason is some athletes, although most athletes are pretty good about understanding that they're being evaluated for a concussion, will feel pressure to go back into the game, especially if you have a coach who's yelling at you. And they'll want to put their helmet on and sneak back into the game without you knowing. So if you hold their helmet, then that's just another barrier for them to go back into the game. And it's important to remove them from play. Once they're removed from play, I like to know what the mechanism of injury was. So ideally, hopefully I was able to see what happened to the athlete, but in some cases you may not be able to see it. And so sometimes, especially now, there's a lot of video reviews that you can look at. So most games are being filmed. So if you have access to a replay, that's also very helpful. And then in some cases, there's uh, someone called a spotter whose job it's actually just to watch and monitor for hits or symptoms or athletes that may be worrisome for concussion, so you can ask the spotter. After I know the mechanism, uh, then I like to do a neurologic exam, so that's just cranial nerves and your basic neurologic exam that you all are hopefully familiar with. And really, you just, again, want to assess and rule out cervical spine injuries and any serious intracranial pathology. One unique thing I like to do with these concussed athletes is ask some basic questions that are called Maddox questions. Are any of you familiar with this? Just by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with Maddox questions? Just our sports faculty, great. So um, Maddox questions are simple things that you can ask the athlete, more about the situation that they're in. And if you don't know some of these questions, just remember you can look at the scoreboard, and I'm a Cal Bear, so I always like to show Cal beating Stanford here, but um, just make sure the athlete doesn't look at the scoreboard, but you can always look at the scoreboard. But these questions can be, you know, what venue are we at today? Who scored last? What quarter is it? Uh, do you remember who won last week? Those are simple questions that you can ask the athlete that most athletes will know the answer or two, um, and, and you'd be surprised and some concussed athletes will be slow to respond to those. And if you have any doubt, if there's any question of your mind, whether there may be a concussion or not, sit them out. So I would say, when in doubt, sit them out. So let's get back to our athlete. So let's say we've removed him from play, um, and we know that removal from play is actually really important. So this was a study that was published in 2018. It was a uh, prospective study looking at a cohort of athletes, 30 university and four military um, academies were a part of this study, and they had nearly 500 concussed athletes, and they looked at those who were removed from play early versus those who were removed from play later. And the two criteria they used to determine if they were removed from play early, they asked two questions. So did the athlete immediately report the injury, yes or no? And was the athlete immediately removed from play, yes or no? And if it was yes to both those questions, then they were categorized into that, that early removal group. And what they found is that the early removal group or the immediate removal group had a lower likelihood of missing more than 14 days. And similarly, that immediate removal group had an even lower likelihood of missing more than 21 days. So the gist of this study is early removal can potentially lead to quicker recovery.
So back to our case, so we've removed that athlete from play, we've updated coach and said, yeah, coach, you know, we, we're worried about a concussion, he needs to sit out. And we're gonna monitor him on the sidelines, look if he develops any other symptoms, because we know, as we talked about, that concussion symptoms can develop sequentially over the course of time. But, you know, what else can we do? Are we just gonna remove him from play and that's it? So I always like to do further evaluation, and that further evaluation consists of a neurocognitive screen. This is best performed in the locker room or a quiet area, somewhere that's distraction-free, where you can have a very comprehensive evaluation. And the tool I like to use is called the SCAT-5. How many of you are familiar or have used the SCAT-5? Show of hands. Okay, so a couple of you. Awesome, and they're probably gonna come out with a SCAT-6 soon, um, but we'll kind of go through the main components of the SCAT-5, and this is designed for athletes who are over 12 years of age, and there's also a child SCAT that we'll talk about briefly. But the first thing that you go through with the SCAT is just a graded symptom scoring list. Now, this is a very busy slide, but it just illustrates how many different symptoms can manifest when you have a concussion, right? So what the athlete will do is you'll go through each of these symptoms, so headache, for example, and have them grade it on a scale of zero to six, six being the most severe, zero being none at all. And so you go through each of these symptoms one by one, or they can mark it themselves. And what you'll total is the total number of symptoms as well as their symptom severity score. And the symptom severity severity score is just the sum of all of the, um, the numbers that they, they select. Um, and this is really helpful. Um, one is not only just seeing what sort of symptoms they have, but also the severity. If you have the privilege of being able to follow up with this athlete in clinic, you can repeat this and track them over time. So it's really great data. And I should back up and say that the SCAT-5 is available online for free as well. So if you just Google SCAT-5, you can download this and it's readily available for anyone to use. Um, and in a clinical setting, because uh, you can use this both on the sidelines, in the locker room, or in the clinic. Uh, in the clinic, if you train your staff or have your staff hand this to the student athlete before your appointment, that's a really efficient way uh, to get all this data without making your 15 minute follow up appointment so burdensome to go through all this concussion stuff. Another component of the SCAT-5 is to do cognitive screening, so that's just your basic orientation questions. There's also an immediate memory component of it. And what this is, is basically you'll read a list of words and uh, I'll read the list of words to you all. Um, and then they will have the athlete repeat it back. So for example, the word list may be elbow, apple, carpet, saddle, bubble, and you'll read that to the athlete and then they'll repeat it back to you and you'll do that three times. And they wanna just remember as many words as they can. It doesn't matter the order that they do it. And then you're gonna tell them to remember those words. So you're all, your words to remember for this talk are elbow, apple, carpet, saddle, bubble. And then I'm gonna ask you later because we ask our athletes later what those words were, okay? And I will caution you, some athletes who have had a concussion or have had done the SCAT-5 before have the word list memorized like myself. I can just spew off elbow, apple, carpet, saddle, bubble to you. So there's an alternate word list that's 10 words long. Uh, that's also available on the SCAT that you can use too. Then you're gonna ch check areas of concentration. So the way we do this is by having them repeat digits backwards. And this is actually very challenging for me even to do when I don't have a concussion. Um, but generally what you do is you say, I'm gonna read you a list of numbers and I want you to repeat them back to me in reverse order. So for example, if I say 719, you're gonna say 917. And you progress through that and the string of, of numbers progressively gets a little bit longer. And then the last component that you're gonna do is have them say their months in reverse order, starting from the last month of the year, start going towards the first month of the year. After you do some of those cognitive things, then you do a neurologic screen. So this uh, is part of your just neuro exam that you probably have already done, right? So this includes looking at Romberg, pronator drift, finger to nose, doing that task. And then the unique thing for the SCAT is doing a balance examination. This is called the Modified Balance Error Scoring System, or MBES. Uh, and this is what it looks like. And I've gotten a question if this is me. No, it's not me. I wish I was that ripped, but uh, that is not me. Um, but essentially what you're gonna do, and I, I tend to do it just without, so you can also do it with an unstable surface, so like a pillow or an Airx pad. But in concussed athletes, I just tend to do it on the floor because um, most clinics don't have a pillow that you want to put their stinky feet on and have them stand, stand on it and then the next patient put their head. Um, but you're gonna have them stand first with their feet together, hands on their hips, eyes closed for 20 seconds. And you're looking for certain errors that they're gonna make. So those errors include opening their eyes, uh, lifting their hands off their hip, lifting their feet or losing their balance, or dropping their hip by 30 degrees. And over those 20 seconds, you're gonna calculate how many errors they have or tabulate how many errors they have. 
After they do this, the double leg stance, you're gonna have them move on to the single leg stance. So they're gonna balance on their non-dominant foot. Again, close their eyes, hands on hips for 20 seconds and calculate the number of errors they have. And then the last one is the tandem stance, which is also very challenging, but their non-dominant foot is gonna be in the back. And they're again, hands on hips, close their eyes. If they're super wobbly with these first ones, then I tend not to regress them further, and I just document that they weren't able to do the, the further modified best. But um, a simple, quick, easy balance test that you can do in clinic as well. And then the last thing we do after all this testing is that delayed recall. So do you all remember what those words were that I said? You guys can shout them out if you remember. Yeah, I hear a bunch of mixed, so elbow, apple, yeah, carpet, saddle, bubble. There you go. So it's hard to do, right? But um, that's what we do for our athletes, and um, uh, that's the last component of the SCAT 5. And so you'll tabulate, there's a total score that you can do at the end of this SCAT, which is really helpful. And again, it's really helpful to have a baseline. So if you're fortunate enough to have an athletic trainer who's done this for the athlete, and you can get the report or have the athlete bring it in, you can repeat it to see if they're making any improvements when you're following up with them. And it's really important to know that this should not be a standalone measure of diagnosing what a concussion is. We have a lot of different tools out there. And so um, it's just another thing that you can have that can help you diagnose a concussion and monitor their progress to recovery. So I also mentioned that you know that's only for ages 12 or older, so there's also a child SCAT. The only difference between the child SCAT and that is that the child SCAT includes reports from both the parent and the child. Instead of the months, we have the younger kids just do days in reverse order because months might be a little more challenging. There's no orientation or Maddox questions. And then the single leg stance we don't do in the younger group. We only do it for if they're older than 10 for that modified best. So the child SCAT is also available online as a free tool for you to use too. Another test that I really like to do in clinic and for my concussed or potentially concussed athletes is the vestibular ocular motor screening test or simply known as VOMS. And this assesses five areas of both the vestibular and the ocular system. And we can kind of practice these together and this is what the VOMS testing consists of. So the first one is smooth pursuits. So essentially what you're doing, it's kind of like when you're testing cranial nerves, the H test that you do. It's very similar to that, but you're just gonna have the patient or um, athlete focus on a fixed object and you're just gonna see how their eyes track as they move and you're looking for any reproduction of symptoms. And so those symptoms are headache, dizziness, nausea, or fogginess. So yes, no to symptoms. And then if they do have symptoms, have them graded on a scale of zero to 10 on how severe those symptoms are. So smooth pursuits is the first one. Then you move on to horizontal and vertical saccades. So we can practice this and you at home can practice as well. Uh, typically the examiner will be there, but we can practice just with our own hands. So if you put two fingers straight out in front of you, about two shoulder widths apart, what you're gonna do is you're gonna keep your head still, but your eyes are gonna look from left to right as quick as you can on your fingers. So we can all practice that. So you're just gonna keep your head still and look side to side at your fingers as quick as you can and see if you develop any of those symptoms. So that's horizontal saccades. Then you'll do it in a vertical fashion too. So not only do we make them do it side to side, we do it up and down as well. So looking up and down as quickly as you can between those two points. It's kind of a tough thing to do. Like, I don't know if you all developed any symptoms. I always feel like I get a little dizzy, but um, that's where it's good to have that baseline score for them. After we do that, we do something that's called near point convergence. Uh, so the, the studies say that it should be 14 point font. You can use a little tongue depressor. We have them pre-printed out like 14 point font on tongue depressors that are in our exam rooms. And you're gonna have them put it in, or you're gonna put it in front of their nose and slowly bring it closer. And they're gonna tell you when they see double. And once they see double, you're gonna stop there and measure to where it goes to the tip of their nose and measure that distance. And I like to do this a couple of times because sometimes their eyes can fatigue over time. So the first score may be excellent, right? So less than six centimeters is considered to be normal. And then the second or third time, they may be way out here around 10 centimeters and that's just from them fatiguing. If they're able to tolerate that and they don't have any symptoms, then I can progress to the more advanced VOMS testing. So the next one is called VOR, or vestibular ocular reflex. So we can all practice this too. So what you're gonna do is stick out your thumb in front of you, and instead of moving your eyes, you're actually gonna fixate your eyes on the back of your thumb. And it's to a beat of 180 beats per minute. So I have like a little metronome app that I like to use in clinic. But what you're gonna have the athlete do is turn their head side to side as fast as they can while staring at the back of their thumb. So you can all practice doing that. So that's the VOR. 
And then the last one is very dynamic. It's the visual motion sensitivity, which you can see here. So this one, again, thumb's gonna be out in front, and they're actually gonna rotate their whole body 160 degrees as they fixate on the back of their thumb. And again, you're gonna ask them if they have any reproduction of those symptoms, and then that completes your vomit testing. So I know it sounds like a lot, but it's kinda like when you're learning a new physical exam skill. Once you practice it, it's really quick to do. You could do this within five minutes or less. So it's a really great tool. And how do we interpret these scores? So not only do we look to see if they're symptomatic, but we know that you know, individuals who don't have a concussion tend to have very few symptoms with VOMS testing. If their total symptom score is greater than or equal to two, it increases their concussion probability by at least 46%. And that near point convergence distance, if it's greater than or equal to five, then it also increases our concussion probability by 34%. And I think that the VOMS testing is actually going to be a part of the new SCAT-6 when it comes out. More to come, but that's my prediction, um, just because it's such a helpful tool in guiding us to determine whether an athlete has a concussion or not. So let's say that our athlete we were evaluating in the locker room has high scores on the SCAT, very symptomatic with VOMS, we diagnose him with a concussion. Then I like to give a handout. I like to first tell the athlete that he has a concussion and tell coach and update all necessary parties, but that includes parents. So I like to give the parent a handout. This is available online through the California Interscholastic Federation. Um, and it basically talks about just some precautions for the parent to look out for over the next 24 to 48 hours. And it also gives them some recommendations. So medications that they should avoid, things that they should do throughout the night, red flag warnings, and that they should follow up with their physician within 72 hours. So now that we've diagnosed our athlete with the concussion, the next question is, how long is it gonna take for me to recover, right? So the standard management for a concussion is usually resting for the first 24 to 48 hours, and rest is defined as sleep, adequate hydration, and nutrition. So those are the three things I want the athlete to really focus on for those first 24 to 48 hours. And the question you're gonna get is like, how long is it gonna take for me to recover? So we know that in young children, uh, average is around four weeks or up to four weeks for them to get better. And then adults tend to recover a little bit quicker, 10 to 14 days. And that's just because kids' brains are still developing. That's what we suspect. And I like to counsel all of my athletes and parents about concussions as well, um, and letting them know that the symptoms that they're feeling, uh, in 80% of the time, they tend not to last more than one to three months post-injury. And the really important thing is that every child's concussion is different. So just because you had a concussion once doesn't mean you're gonna feel the same or recover the same the next time. Or just because your older brother had a concussion and he got back playing within a week doesn't mean that that's gonna be the case for you. So every concussion is different. Another question is, what is recovery? Like, how do I know when I'm recovered? And there's really two key components to recovery. This includes return to learn, as well as return to sports. So those are the two big pillars that we talk about with regard to concussion recovery. And I always say that first, you have to return to learn, then you can return to sport. That's really important for our student athletes because we don't want them to get behind in school. So let's talk about how do we return our athletes back to school? This is a graduated return to learn protocol. This is a very busy slide, but it's staged, and we'll go through each of these stages, but there's generally four stages. So the first stage is after they've done that first 24 to 48 hours of rest, they can start resuming their daily activities. So that can be doing things around the house, reading things in very limited amounts of time, maybe five to 10 minutes, and then gradually building up from there. And once they're able to tolerate that, then they can start doing some schoolwork outside of the classroom. So, you know, they may have missed like a couple days, they may have a ton of homework to catch up on, so you can tell them, well, maybe try catching up on some of your assignments at home and seeing how you feel. And um, as they start doing more of those cognitive activities, you just wanna make sure that they're able to increase their, their cognitive tolerance without worsening any of their symptoms. If they're able to tolerate at home stuff, then you can say, well, I think you can try going back to school. And you can have them maybe go back for a half day or go back to school but have frequent breaks and um, increase their, their academic activities and responsibilities during this time. And once they're able to tolerate that, then they can go back to school full time and uh, get caught up on all their assignments and not miss any more school. And I think it's really important as healthcare providers to make sure that we provide academic accommodations to our concussed athletes. We really need to break that lazy athlete stereotype, right? And so there's a lot of areas of accommodations that you can provide, which goes towards you know, attendance, so partial day school versus full day school, breaks, having frequent breaks. Maybe their vision is really symptomatic for them, so you can have them listen to stuff or you know, modify the way that they learn. 
um, having them have a note that lets them take tests later or longer periods for their assignments, I think is really important, or longer time for their exams if they need to. Uh, and then also a note for PE because they're not cleared for physical activity yet. Uh, and this is small, but I have another slide next that has um, all the great resources that are available on the California Interscholastic Federation website. Uh, this not only includes that templated letter that you can use to provide those accommodations and that information sheet I showed you earlier, but there's also uh, graded symptom checklist that you can use, return to learn and return to play protocols, and it's available in Spanish, which is really nice too. Uh, and hopefully this QR code works, but you can all scan that um, to take a look at that website. Great, great resource. So now that we know how to return to learn, let's talk about how to return back to play. So again, this is a graduated protocol, very staged, progressive return to physical activity, and they must spend at least one day at each stage, and you're gonna monitor for any development of symptoms. And I will point out that in California, for those of you online and here who are physicians in California, um, there's actually a law that states that anyone who's under the age of 18 cannot return back to physical activity uh, within seven days of being diagnosed by a concussion. And that diagnosis actually has to be by a physician. Um, and then they have to go through the return to play protocol and uh, what they call an identified concussion monitor, which can be the athletic trainer, must sign off on each of those stages as they do that. And it's also important to note that all coaches uh, are required to receive training on concussions. And you know, I think for the most part, all the coaches I've worked with are very aware and sensitive towards concussions and respect what you have to say as a healthcare provider. Um, but there is free courses online that the coaches go through too. So let's talk about that graduated return to sport. So again, another busy slide, but we'll break it down very simply. So after that first 24 to 48 hours, then I let them do symptom limited, like normal activities of daily living. So that just like walking around the house, doing things and seeing if that provokes any of their symptoms. If they're able to tolerate that, then we actually start light aerobic exercise. The one I like to do is stationary biking um, because it's stationary, they're not moving. Uh, it's not like a treadmill where their head's bobbing up and down, which can cause jostling in their brain. And they don't have all that sensory input of just moving around, right? So if someone's concussed and they're very dizzy or they have sensitivity with that vision test that we do, a stationary bike, they're just literally there. Hopefully it's not a Peloton with the screen, it's just an old school stationary bike. And they can start pedaling for about five minutes to see if it develops any symptoms and we call it symptom limited activity meaning if they have a 2 out of 10 headache to start with it shouldn't exceed a 2 out of 10 when they're on there um, and they're going to monitor for symptoms throughout the day because we know that some of the symptoms can be developed prolonged or delayed after their activity if they're able to tolerate that then we do more sports specific exercise i just call this more aerobic type activity so if they can do stationary biking then we'll clear them to do some light jogging outside uh, or whatever specific aerobic exercise is associated with their sport. If they can do that, then we say, well, you can try some non-contact sport-specific drills. So that can be for a basketball athlete, shooting baskets, um, doing non-contact drills like layups, uh, soccer athlete doing some passing drills, no headers or anything like that. Um, and if they're able to tolerate that, usually for the CIF return to play protocol, this is when they would come to see the physician to get signed off and cleared to start doing some full contact stuff. And once they're cleared for full contact, then they can resume their normal activities so they can do a full practice. This is more for football players, but in pads, right? Um, and the big thing here though, is you wanna assess their psychological readiness. So like our 16 year old star running back who had the concussion, like if it was a hard hit, is he ready? Like mentally, is he ready to go back? Or it's been, you know, seven to 10 days and he's been off practice. Like how does he feel about going back? So trying to evaluate that I think is really important. And then if they're able to tolerate full contact practice, then they can finally return to sport. So again, you know, a graded protocol that we go through, a lot of steps, but the sheets that are available for you are really, really helpful. And your athletic trainers, if you're fortunate enough to have one um, or work with one or have the athlete uh, go to a school that has one is gonna be your best ally. So now that we've gone through return to learn and return to play, the question is, when can I play in the game, right? So you have to have completed that graduated return to play protocol and you have to go back to school without symptoms and be caught up on all your schoolwork, or mostly caught up on all your schoolwork. And then I say you're cleared for the game. So that's kind of my protocol for returning our athletes.
So what about those athletes who have those persistent symptoms that just seem to linger on and on, right? So let's talk about a different case. So we have a 21-year-old collegiate female water polo player. This is her third concussion that she received four weeks ago. She had two prior concussions that were uncomplicated, and she's complaining of a persistent headache, some mental fogginess, and difficulty concentrating. She's able to tolerate her schoolwork without having any breaks, but hasn't really gotten back to full physical activity. Uh, she has a normal cervical spine, neurologic, and vestibular ocular exam. So in those athletes who have persistent post-concussive symptoms, uh, this is defined as being longer than two weeks in adults uh, and greater than one month in children and adolescents. So in our acutely concussed patients, we wanna see them like every week or every two weeks to get them through that protocol. But in this case, you may wanna prolong those follow-ups as they try to rehab and work on things or just consider referring them to a concussion specialist at this point to help with this uh, you know, persistent symptom, whatever it may be. And these can be really challenging because as we saw with that symptom graded checklist, there's a lot of overlapping clinical profiles, right? A lot of symptoms that can overlap and I don't expect you to read all of that. It's just a pretty slide and there's a better one on the, the next slide. But really what we wanna do is identify the predominant physical signs and symptoms that are really preventing this athlete from returning back to sport. So an emerging um, area or concept is evaluating for what we call a concussion subtype. So uh, this is something that we're all looking at and I think clinically we're all using more for these persistent symptoms, but typically these symptoms tend to go into different buckets, right? So some of their symptoms may be more vestibular ocular related, right? Like their vision isn't better and that's the only lingering thing. Others just maybe they have persistent neck pain or soft tissue pain in the neck region. Some of them may have a lot of anxiety or their mood may be affected and that's the thing that's preventing them from going back. And then in others, it could just be like a headache that's really bothersome and for some reason, anytime they ramp up their physical activity, their headache reappears. So looking and trying to classify the symptoms into different buckets is really helpful. And then, you know, once we identify that bucket, we can refer out for more specialty care, which is what the athlete at this stage really, really needs. Um, but this is an emerging concept and there's a lot more research being done, so more to come in this area. I wanted to highlight for you all this article that's really, really great that was published in 2021. It talks about a brief physical examination for sports-related concussion that you can do in the outpatient setting. So it basically goes through all the physical exam things that you can do in a nice way. Um, and what I liked about this article is they also break it down into different concussion subtypes that are really helpful to think about that I tend to think about in my clinic. So one bucket is whether it's the cervicogenic type, right? So usually these types of patients will have neck pain, and then they may complain of what we call late exercise size and tolerance. So we're looking at whether or not the athlete can do physical activity and to what degree of their heart rate, right? So late exercise tolerance means they can do physical activity, but once they get over 70% of their heart rate, then they get really symptomatic. In contrast, some athletes may have early exercise intolerance where they're at less than 70% of their predicted max heart rate and they get symptomatic. So they barely get their heart rate up and then they become very symptomatic. Um, another bucket or area may be that vestibular ocular group, which we've talked about. So they may have vision issues or feel really dizzy. There may be the mood group that have a lot of emotional ability or anxiety or depression. And then there's a group that has more autonomic or physiologic symptoms that are kind of nonspecific, but they may have positive orthostatics when you check them and they'll have early exercise intolerance. So how we treat these subtypes, so for the cervicogenic group, we usually just refer them to physical therapy to really focus on soft tissue, range motion, and those types of modalities, and then start them with submaximal aerobic exercise. For that vestibular ocular group, I tend to refer them to vestibular rehab or vestibular ocular PT, which can be really helpful. And there's home exercises that they can do, which is very similar to that balm sussing that helps train their eyes and balance sussing that they can do as well. And we also start them on submaximal aerobic exercise. For the mood group, this can be more challenging as you are all aware. I think you know mental health is one of the most challenging things to deal with in the primary care setting. And this is where you really need a multidisciplinary approach. So having them get connected with a neuropsychologist or just a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, sorry, can be very helpful. And again, starting them on that submaximal aerobic exercise. And then for that autonomic or physiologic group, uh, usually we just start them on submaximal aerobic exercise. So you're like, man, Dr. Hadami, you're talking a lot about submaximal aerobic exercise for all these groups. Like, what's the deal, right? So we know that exercise can actually be helpful for concussion recovery. And this is counter to what we used to think, you know, 10 years ago, right? We used to say, just rest for as long as you can, don't do anything, 
until you feel better. Um, but we know now that exercise has beneficial effects for the autonomic nervous system, and it can help with cerebral blood flow regulation. So if you remember way back when we talked about the pathophysiology and how there's decreased cerebral blood flow, exercise can actually help with the regulation of that cerebral blood flow. And it also helps with brain neuroplasticity. It can help with cortical connectivity and activation, and it improves our spatial memory. And the thought behind this is that it increase, increases something called BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is used for neuron repair after injury. And so one way that we approach doing submaximal exercise for athletes is using something called the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test, or the BCTT. This is a validated test that's used to measure the amount of aerobic activity exercise that's safe to perform even in that acute phase of a concussion. And the goal of it is to really identify that sub-symptom threshold. So what level of activity can they do before they worsen their symptoms? And so this is how it looks. So it's uh, similar to the bulk treadmill test. So they're gonna be on a treadmill. They're gonna gradually increase their exercise intensity over time. And then during that, you're gonna record serial measurements. And this is something that some physical therapists can do, which is really helpful. So I don't expect you all to do this in the clinic and have a treadmill and go to your BCTTs. But they check blood pressure, heart rate. They also ask about rating of perceived exertion, so how hard they feel they're working. And then ask about their symptoms. And so they're gonna get a point for every one symptom that they develop. So say they're on the treadmill, they felt fine, and then they got a headache. So they get a point for getting a headache. And then if they had a headache, that was like a one out of 10 headache, they get another point if it goes to a two out of 10. So you count how many points total that they get. And you're gonna stop once they have any symptoms that are greater than or equal to three. And then you're gonna record what heart rate level they were at once they developed that symptom or that score, right? And that's really gonna be the heart rate you're gonna use to help them get back to exercise. So that's the heart rate you're gonna use. Uh, and we'll talk about how to prescribe a uh, protocol for them. So. This is how I use the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test. So we identify the symptoms that allow them to do submaximal exercise, right, and what heart rate that occurs. And then I have them do 80% of that threshold for about 15 to 20 minutes and see how they feel. And if they're tolerating that, we can slowly increase that target heart rate by five to 10 beats per minute and then repeat this process until the, they can fully achieve that 80% of that heart rate that we identified with the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test. And once they're able to do that, then we can resume that return to play protocol. So usually they're at that stage where they're stationary biking or maybe doing that aerobic activity and then they develop a lot of symptoms and they can't move past it. This is a great way to really fine tune what level of activity they can do without exacerbating those symptoms. So that's that Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test. And we know that exercise, the sub-symptom threshold aerobic activity can actually be really helpful for return to play. This was a study published by um, Letty, who's in Buffalo. He's the one who started the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test, but it was uh, published in 2019. It was a multi-center perspective randomized control trial that looked at both male and female adolescent athletes. And they were either assigned an aerobic group where they did that sub-symptom threshold activity or a stretching group where they just stretched and they didn't do any activity at all. And what they found is that the aerobic group had a return around 13 days, a median return around 13 days, compared to the stretching group, which returned around 17 days, which was statistically significant. So the takeaway from the study is that the sub-symptom threshold aerobic activity group had a quicker recovery than the stretching group. So another reason why you know, sub-symptom threshold aerobic activity can be helpful to return your athletes. So in summary, uh, we talked about the definition of a concussion. We talked about the pathophysiology and epidemiology of a concussion. Hopefully you're comfortable on explaining how to do a sideline evaluation. Uh, we talked about all the different tools out there, and there's many, many more, but those are the ones that I think are the highest yield for you to use to assess and follow up with athletes who have a concussion. We talked about the typical timeline for recovery, so you should all feel comfortable in counseling athletes and parents on their typical recovery time. And then talked about how to return to play and return to sport, and then those more challenging cases where you may think to refer to a concussion specialist. I will uh, leave these here. This is a position statement and consensus statements. Like I said, there's gonna be a new one published soon because they just met last October. Um, but this is our big primary care sports group, the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. So these two position statements are really great resources. The CDC also has a lot of great things available, both for parents and for pr providers. Uh, and then I'll leave this here too. The University of Buffalo has a lot of great physical exam resources that you can look at. And then finally, here at UCSF, we have a sports concussion program and are happy to see any athletes that you want to send our way. Uh, so here's our information here and you can feel free to scan our QR code.
here's my references, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all have. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hadamia. Any questions? Um, we have some questions from our uh, online audience. I will start there. So, um, Dr. Hadamia, is the VOM still useful in a clinic setting days to weeks after the trauma, or is it primarily for immediate evaluation? Yeah, great question. I think it's good for both situations. So honestly, in the acutely concussed athlete, they're gonna be very symptomatic typically with VOMS testing. Um, it's helpful to do on the sideline because if they don't have any symptoms with VOMS and they're not that symptomatic, then you're like, well, maybe they don't have a concussion. So that can kind of help you in that regard. I think it's most useful in follow-up in clinic, um, namely because the athlete may be feeling a lot better. So their symptoms score sheet may show really low scores and they may have all their cognition back and they're able to repeat those words back to you and their balance is maybe so-so, but when you do the bomb testing, they become very symptomatic. Um, so I think it's really helpful, particularly in follow-up. Um, and then the other thing too is one of the most common, and I don't know for you, Dr. Center, or Dr. Bergen, or any other physicians here who see concussions, I find that a lot of my patients who have post-concussive symptoms tend to have what I call convergence insufficiency. So when we're doing that accommodation component, they get really dizzy or it gets really blurry for them, and they can really benefit from that vestibular rehab. Um, so I think it's really helpful to do that VOMS testing um, in clinic as well. Hello. Um, for an athlete who does sustain a blow to the head, um, at what point would you consider doing a CT to rule out something structural? Yeah, great question. So, you know, again, it goes towards, uh, am I concerned about anything in the cervical spine? So do they have like focal neurologic deficits, tingling in the arm? Um, and again, your neuro exam right on the field, right? So. Um, Basically, if they have any sort of focal neurologic deficits, you look at their pupils and are not equal or reactive, you know, those are all signs or symptoms that you're more worried for. Um, there is also, uh, to reiterate the importance of just removal from play, so let's say that you feel the athlete is fine, um, you're gonna remove them and put them on the sidelines. One of our colleagues, Dr. Berrigan, actually had a case where a high school athlete pulled himself out of the game because he thought he was concussed. Uh, and clinically, he um, seemed to be okay, but he was just held out of the game because he did express concern of him having a concussion. Uh, and then the following day, he developed some ecchymosis right around his ear, right? And that's called battle sign. Um, and so he got a head CT following that. So, uh, you know, you can only imagine what would have happened if that athlete had returned back to play and sustain another blow. So just another important thing to make sure to think about and another plug for just removing them if you're in doubt. Another question from our online audience. Um, what symptoms should warrant going back a step in return to school or play? Some symptoms are vague, like mental fog, fatigue, and so wondering if just a vague feeling it or uh, a feeling worse is sufficient to make an athlete go back in, in a step and return to school or play? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's the most challenging part with managing concussions, just the, the symptoms, right? They're so broad and they can overlap in many ways. Um, so my kind of thought on that is if they're developing a lot of symptoms, I try to explore when that occurs. So if they're going back to school, let's say that they're able to tolerate the beginning of school, but it's towards the end of the day that they're really feeling their symptoms. Then, you know, maybe they don't have to go back home, but they can just take more frequent breaks during school to help with that. Or if it's during a particular class, like some, you know, athletes will say, yeah, like my more challenging courses like math or chemistry is when I get really symptomatic, then maybe they just need to dial it back in that class. So I like to really explore and ask with my history and get more information when they're getting symptomatic before taking them back a step. Thanks. Um, to your knowledge, what like contraindications are there to pharmacotherapy, such as like NSAIDs or or Tylenol or maybe even Zofran for um, student athletes who are having symptoms of a concussion? Yeah, good question. Um, so you know, usually I say Tylenol is relatively safe to give, especially in that acute phase. Theoretically, um, like on that CIF handout, you'll see that they say no NSAIDs just because you're worried about a head bleed. But by the time you're following up with them in clinic, you're 
pretty confident they hopefully pretty confident they don't have a head bleed at that stage. So if they have a persistent headache and they've been using Tylenol, then I say you can try using NSAIDs as well, like ibuprofen or naproxen. Uh, if they need preventative medications or pharmacotherapy for headaches, usually I'll talk about magnesium or riboflavin. Those things can be helpful too. Kind of the stuff you use for chronic migraine headaches, right, as prevention. Um, and then the other question was Zofran as well. So again, you know, sometimes in the acute setting, I don't want it to mask any other symptoms. So uh, I will tend not to prescribe that acutely, but when I'm following up with them, if they have a lot of vestibular ocular system symptoms and they're feeling really dizzy, uh, then we can try some Zofran as well too, or meclizine. Mm -hmm. And we'll have one last question. Great talk. Um, question for you. Are there any early indicators that point towards chronic post-concussive syndrome in patients? Because um, we see, I'm a pain management specialist, I see a lot of chronic whiplash, chronic mm -hmm. concussion. So any, anything early that might point towards what patient might be developing uh, chronic symptoms of post-concussive syndrome? Yeah, good question. I don't think we have enough research out there to know definitively what sort of symptoms correspond or predict who's going to develop those post-concussive symptoms. Um, so more research needs to be done and is being done in that area. Um, you know, they've looked at things like different biomarkers to try to predict that, um, but nothing definitive that we know of as of yet. Um, and then, you know, there's a whole other discussion about uh, repetitive head injuries, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, you know, all those different things. Uh, second impact syndrome, which would, got all the news buzz with Tua. Um, but, you know, nothing that we know of that can predict it. And it's really hard to study just because there's so many factors that play into it, right? Like head impacts, how frequent, at what velocity. So we don't know the dose response relationship to that. And then the symptoms are so broad and overlapping. Um, and there's many other factors that can play to it, as you saw from a mental health standpoint, medication standpoint. So a tough thing to study. How frequently do you see that in your practice, uh, chronic, uh, chronic post-concussive syndrome patients having? Yeah, you know, I think. Symptoms? In our clinic, uh, we tend to see sports concussions more. And uh, usually they follow, if we're lucky, a very typical time course for recovery. Um, in some cases, though, they get referred a little bit later, so their symptoms are more prolonged. Um, but often it's into one of those buckets that I alluded to, and we really focus the rehab and therapy based off of what their predominant symptomology is, and uh, they tend to get a lot better over time, so. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm.